today we are talking to Andrew Storter, who recently acquired all things Cedar uh, just in September here past. So we're here to tell his story today. And uh, Andrew actually asked if we could do the session together and invited Brad from Faskin and Joel, who is his banker at RBC, to join him today um, to tell the story with him about how it went and 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 things that he's learned um, and how it all came together. So um, Andrew, you've, you've been a champion of, of acquisition entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship since you kind of stepped into this, this role. And I know you're, you're so open and willing to share your learnings with other people in the community. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Brad and Joel, thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to get into a little bit about Village Wealth for people who are new to our community and our sessions. So you can understand a little bit about us and where we're coming from. Then we'll jump into intros and, and a bit of housekeeping. So um, also I wanted to mention Faskin, who is uh, Brad's firm here today. Faskin is our sponsor for this webinar series and we're, we're so grateful to have their support in this in the series. They were voted uh, best law firm for 2024 across Canada. They're one of the most active law firms in M&A across Canada. Um, and we're very grateful to have their support through a lot of the activity that Village Wealth that Village Wealth puts on. So thank you again, Brad. Village Wealth is uh, an acquisition management platform and we are on a mission to make acquisitions more accessible for people who are buying small businesses, um, mostly considered my, micro, Main Street businesses and lower middle market. And we just found that more supports and more uh, community was needed at this end of the market for people who are acquiring their first business. And we are on a mission to set out to do that. So as many people know from, we have lots of advisors that join us on the session today, lots of business owners and buyers who join us, and we are witnessing the most significant transfer of business ownership in history, um, mostly because of the age of um, the, the kind of predominant population of entrepreneurs. 75% um, of small businesses will exit in the next decade. It's uh, approximately $30 trillion worth of business assets across North America that are, are going to be transitioning. And with that, entrepreneurship through acquisition is on the rise, which is the practice of someone wanting to get into business for themselves instead of doing a traditional startup, but through buying an existing business. And they're doing this through use of their own funds. They're doing this by raising capital from investors, pooling capital from friends and family, um, or, or conducting a self-funded search, which the majority of Village Wealth's community are, are self-funded searchers, um, individuals who are buying business with their own funds and then using uh, bank financing to, to fund the rest of the transaction. And so that's what we we put our arms around that community and, and we help them move through the process of buying, buying their first business. And we do this because we found that 67% of first time business buyers actually fail to transact. The process is complex. Navigating capital can be one of the biggest barriers to acquisition. And that's why we've come together as Village Wealth to, uh, to help people along the way. So if you're new to Village Wealth, we're an acquisition management platform that brings together access to financing, guidance, and community, as well as a marketplace where buyers and sellers can register their search. If you're on the buy side and people who are selling can register um, businesses that are for sale on the sell side, there's an algorithm that matches the parties and both parties can be searchable so that people can make the first move and, and communication is managed within the platform. And then when people have found a business to buy, that's where we really step up and, and we get involved in deal structuring strategies. Uh, we're building software for to support deal structuring and papering the letter of intent. We have these services available now and are building the software to support uh, this with more efficiency. Um, Multi-lender management, term sheet managing management, and monitoring the deal through to closing is what uh, what our bread and butter is. So Andrew came through there, our programming with us. Um, he was he, He's one of our success stories and we're very happy that he's here uh, to share the story with you guys all to here today. 
Um, if people are just starting to begin their search or they're curious about who's in our community that is buying businesses, uh, Village Wealth Marketplace is available and open to anyone who is buying or selling a business. Uh, it is free to use the marketplace. So anyone selling a business, we've got business brokers and M&A firms that are using it across the country. Um, this, we've just changed the pricing recently. So our subscribing member right now, um, please get in touch with us and, uh, and we can chat about the new model that we've, we've just recently rolled out. Um, and then if you're in any various stage of buying a business and you want to chat with us, uh, Giselle's on the call with us here today as well. She's uh, most people's first point of contact is Giselle. Um, and she is probably the friendliest person you'll ever meet on our team and, uh, loves chatting with people who are going through the process. Uh, so this is a snapshot of our founding team. So we're, we come from backgrounds in finance, marketing, sales, technology. So if you're getting our emails and you want to participate more with us in our community, please don't be shy and feel free to uh, connect with us on LinkedIn or, or through the platform if you create a profile. So just getting to high level housekeeping, uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. If you haven't already, let us know where you're coming from, if you like. Uh, we've done this a little bit. For, so if you're just joining us, uh, we have people right now from Vancouver to uh, Halifax and uh, south of the border as well. I'm going to let the speakers introduce themselves. Then we're going to do some conversation for about 40 minutes um, that is a bit more structured. And then if you have questions, I'm going to leave those until the end. There's about 10 to 15 minutes at the end where we will answer um, audience questions. So feel free to put those in the chat as we go. And with that, that's all you'll hear from me today. And I will leave it to the guys to uh, actually, sorry, one last thing. Um, we do some other events. So we have an in-person uh, buying a business club event. If you are in Calgary and you've never come to one of our meetups, stay tuned. There's another one coming um, in the new year. We just had our last one with over 100 registrants uh, a couple weeks ago. And then our next session, uh, we haven't updated this picture, but our next session in our next webinar virtual session like this is going to be on financial due diligence in January. So stay tuned for announcements on those upcoming events. You can follow us on LinkedIn or you can um, register for a profile to be notified and you'll start getting all of our emails. All right, so with that, I'm gonna let you guys introduce yourselves. Um, Andrew, if you wanna get started and, and start us off and let us know who you are and, and what you did before acquiring a business, but uh, take take the floor. All right, uh, first and foremost, appreciate uh, everybody uh, joining today and, and thank you to Liz and the Village Well team for bringing this together. I'm super passionate about the space, and I think everyone that's kind of taking the time to join this call um, uh, and hear kind of what the three of us have to say, I think are probably in that same boat. So awesome for everyone to be here. Thank you for being here. Very grateful that you're here. Um, so so my career prior to kind of the ETA space uh, has, has always been in kind of the fast-moving consumer goods space, so EPG. So I started my career uh, selling cereal uh, with Kellogg's, so all those great sugary cereals. I then moved over to um, transition at uh, Mars Canada, where I was able to then sell chocolates, all those goodies like Mars bars, Snickers, Twix, M&Ms, uh, and did that for many years. Um, and then uh, then transitioned from there to the Molson Coors uh, Beverage Company and uh, was there for a good stint, did a bunch of different kind of commercial sales leadership roles. And um, prior to leaving there was the chief uh, sales and customer officer for Canada. And uh, like many of you on the call, I have always had this entrepreneurial kind of uh, a flame in the belly and decided that I wanted to take a run at a startup, um, which I think we'll get into a little bit later on today as far as the difference goes. But um, then I, I, I transitioned from Molson Coors Beverage Company into the wonderful world of cannabis, um, where I uh, took a startup uh, for the last five years and recently transitioned out of that business in January of this year as the president and chief operating officer. And, uh, and that's where my acquisition journey started, which we'll get into a little bit later. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. We'll, we'll continue to unravel that story as we go. Uh, Brad. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brad Schneider. It's really great to be here today. Um, thanks to Andrew and Liz and the rest of the team at Village Wealth for um, inviting me to participate in this webinar. 
Um, as Liz stated, I'm a partner at the law firm of Faskin in Calgary. Uh, we're a leading law firm in Canada with over 900 lawyers uh, from coast to coast. Um, we per we're particularly well known for our expertise in mergers and acquisitions, and we're recently awarded the M&A Law Firm of the Year by the ranking agency Best Lawyers. So in terms of my personal practice, I have over 15 years of experience assisting clients with private M&A transactions of all sizes and types in all industries. I've worked on everything from $1 million to $40 billion deals and everything in between. So um, it's kind of a lot of, a lot of, seen, seen a lot of things. But um, as I come from an entrepreneurial background, uh, what excites me most is getting to work with entrepreneurs such as Andrew on their small business M&A transactions. Um, so I can pass it over to Joel now. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, thanks, Brad. And, and again, echo the same sentiment, Liz, and the Village Well team and Andrew for having us. It's it's awesome to be a part of such a passionate group of people here. So yeah, my name is Joel Snodgrass. I am uh, a senior commercial banker with uh, RBC Royal Bank. I play in the diversified space, so I'm fairly industry agnostic. Um, I actually, my background is in agriculture banking in Lethbridge in South and Southern Alberta before my time in Calgary. And coming to Calgary in a bigger center, being based in Bankers Hall, the volumes and what we saw, I've developed a little bit of a niche in the M&A space uh, at the bank, doing a lot of mid to upper mid market deals where Andrew, uh, owners like Andrew, um, opportunities come up and, and I'm here to kind of add value from the lending. Um, the, the stance of where a banker can be looked at as a necessary evil, I'm changing that narrative and showing how key a partnership <laughs> with your banker could actually be. And hopefully Andrew will, will echo that sentiment today in our conversation, but I'm really looking forward to, uh, yeah, the discussion at hand. So thank you. Thanks, Joel. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see your faces more. Um, so, I, Andrew, I'd love to start off by asking you um, how you learned that buying an existing, dis, existing business was even, even a thing, because most people have no idea that this is something that you can do. So how did how did you come to know that this was even a path that existed? Yeah, it, and, and I was absolutely in that camp as well, too. So I think like many of you on the call, um, I, I've always kind of had that entrepreneurial kind of flame. But, you know, I had worked in Fortune 500 uh, companies and, and kind of have always done that uh, corporate kind of gig and certainly mentioned that the startup that I had to get out of my system there that I did the previous five years. But to, to be honest, I actually stumbled across this space via Twitter slash X now. And it was, I think it was a post actually from one of the, the big influencers in the SMB space. Um, and he was advocating that, look, if, if you're, if you're, if you've always wanted to be an entrepreneur, you need to read the, the HBR guide, the, you know, the buying a small business, which is kind of one of the, the few Bibles out there from a content reading standpoint. The other one obviously is buy them build from market Bible. There it is right there. Thank you, Jordan, for, for sharing that, 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 kind of really ignited this kind of like, wow, you can do this. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of just developed this, this kind of thirst for just it, it, taking all the content as you start to look at the space and you start to really do your research um, as much as you could, I could possibly find, I started to download and, and just kind of read about this and, and, you know, Liz, I think it's a good point, right? Because I think that our biggest challenge in this community is actually awareness that, that you can actually do this. And, um, you know, I had always come from a path that said, look, you know, you got to go down this corporate path, which is like work for these big companies and move your way up through that way. I kind of bucked the trend a little bit and said, no, I'm going to take a ch chance at a startup company. Um, and, you know, I think those are two, two traditional kind of paths that we all kind of think that are there. Um, but, you know, buying an existing business that has already done all of these gnarly, difficult, challenging things that startups have to go through, and then being able to actually bring, you know, kind of this experience that I was able to have over kind of two decades of, of being a true practitioner of, of businesses and adding value there on, on some of these kind of uh, professionalization opportunities that you see in these businesses and, and all things Cedar certainly fits that, that mold. I was like, wow, this is absolutely for me. I, I have to do this. I have to find a way to do this. And uh, I never looked back like this. This was the calling. This, this absolutely resonated with everything that I had worked for up until this point in time. And I was absolutely determined once I, I found it 
that this was a path for me. And um, I have not looked back. And I'm so glad I did because it's such an awesome, awesome opportunity for uh, so many things, which we'll touch on later on the call. Thanks, Andrew. I know we talked to a lot of buyers that are at various stages of of searching and learning about this, this, and you were certainly probably the most determined person when we first met. I was like, this, this, he's on a mission. He's going to do this. And your timeline was six months. You said, I'm going to buy a business in six months. And based on the the business review guide, they, they guide, they, they caution people that it can take 18 to 24 months if, if you're even successful. Mm-hmm. Um, so your, your target was, was, was your bar was set high and, and, and <laughs> you certainly you did it. So um, I, can you tell us a little bit about, about all things cedar and 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 the company that you bought and then and then we'll start to get into the deal and, and how things unraveled yeah so so i purchased all things cedar um in september of this year and uh the business has been around for about 25 years so it's 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 certainly you know kind of gone through its cycles uh from startup to kind of sustaining death in a lot of ways but um, really what the, the premise of All Things Theater is, is, you know, we we kind of turn sustainable cedar wood, um, you know, from the Pacific Northwest into high quality outdoor patio and garden furniture. And that's really kind of the problem that we solve and kind of the consumers that we talk to. So um, we're, we're actually, uh, it's, it's really interesting. We're actually an e-com business. So we have, we have not done a single sale in kind of traditional brick and mortar uh, retail, which is really interesting for a business that's been around for 25 years. So uh, 80% of our business is actually south of the border in the U.S. So we have a much, much, uh, you know, greater, uh, you know, total addressable market in the U.S. And I give kudos to 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 my seller uh, who made that decision very early in his, uh, you know, journey building the business that he kind of said, look, the market is so much bigger. Obviously, you know, this is a seasonal business, which I'm going to touch on later on how do you actually mitigate some of the risk factors by getting down south and really expanding through the U S and um, it's, it's, it's certainly, uh, it certainly did that. So, so all things either kind of had all of the, the qualifiers, you know, around, you know, what many of us are looking for when we get into this space, you know, um, recurring revenue or reoccurring revenue actually, which is slightly different um, good margins, you know, certainly um enduringly profitable, kind of all those kind of elements, you know, I, uh, you know, key man risk, those are some of the factors that I looked at in, in doing this. But um, I, I think I was looking for something that had potential. And, you know, I think funny story, we were joking about this a little bit on the, on the start of the call, which was with the website. When I actually uh, got a bit of awareness on the deal, uh, the advisory team that was in the middle of this deal, which was MNP, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, they were great the 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 lead advisor on the thing he's like I, I don't even want to show you and tell you the website because i think it's going to scare you off and that was what he told me and i, I kind of said well that that's a really great intro i'm not sure i necessarily want to even talk further about this but i think this was um this was a blessing in disguise in a way so he gave me the website i looked at it which i'm sure many of you already have or are starting to you'll, you'll see what i'm talking about it, it's it's antiquated like it's, 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 it's been around literally since 1999 is when the previous owner created the website, coded the website, did it all himself. And I mean, massive wow. kudos for doing that. Um, but then in there lies why I love this business. And actually as much as, you know, it hit those, those metrics that we're all looking for, not all of them, but it hit a big chunk of them. Um, the one thing that I realized, even as I got into due diligence and actually even later, this little website that's quite antiquated is the biggest opportunity we have in the business. The the SEO organic on this business, because it's been around for so long, because Google trusts it for so long, actually has tremendous backlinks and tremendous opportunities. So as you think about the opportunity around just checking your list, like you're never going to find the perfect deal. All things Cedar wasn't perfect. There's absolutely opportunities and, and challenges with this business. Largest one being that seasonal, but it certainly had uh, a big opportunity in that website. Other uh, quick factors. I'm, I'm pretty big on outdoor living. Like I think uh, from, from a COVID situation, I think the, you know, the, the fact that e-commerce kind of accelerated I think people are looking at their backyards as an extension of their homes. Uh, and as we see a little bit more of that dynamic of, of working from home and all that, you know, the backyard becomes a really big, important piece of that. So I was a bit big on outdoor living. 
Um, you know, I had, a, I had a very great seller. He's motivated. I think we'll talk a little bit about that and the key areas there. And, you know, honestly, it was the right size for me. It was what I could afford. It, it certainly met the, the, the size of the business that I felt um, had the ability for me to kind of take it on 100% ownership and really drive growth. Thanks for that, Andrew. And it's it, it speaks to kind of how you started looking at, at businesses, you know, and comparing, you know, what am I looking for in a business and, and what are going to check my boxes and not check my boxes. And we hear a lot that people are looking for very strict criteria in, in, in what they're searching for. Um, but most of the time it's not there. And so, so you've got to figure out how to, how to look differently at opportunities and, and find what works for you based on your previous experience and what, um, where's the, where are the hidden gems and where can the opportunity be in some of these companies um, that have those antiquated websites? So thanks for sharing some of your decision-making. Um, yeah. And and as you started to evaluate this company and really think that this could be the one, uh, you know, we started working together and then, you know, it was, okay, who's, who's going to be form the rest of the team. So I'd love to bring Joel and Brad into the conversation now and talk to, have you each speak to, you know, how did you guys decide to work together? How did, what were you all taking into consideration when, when you decided, yeah, let's, let's do this. And this is the team. Andrew, do you want to start us off? Yeah. Yeah, I, I will. And and absolutely excited to to hear Joel and, and Brad talk about this too, but you know, I'm, I'm honestly, this process is, is a bit freaky, right? It's not, it, you know, we, it, when you go down this path, there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of things that you just, you, you know, you just don't know. And, and it's, just, it's natural. So uh, I'm big on teams. Um, you know, I know I needed a great team, you know, um, beside me here, if, if I was going to actually do this and look, there, there's, there's great, there's great law firms, there's great bankers, all that stuff across the space, right? They, they, there's some really, really, um, you know, smart people that, um, you know, really want to do the right thing here. But for me, um, in, in choosing to work with Joel and choosing to work with Joel, it came down to three things. And the first one was, um, were they actually passionate about this space? And you heard both of them kind of in their opening, right? They, 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 they were passionate. I didn't have to actually explain to them, you know, when, when I do 90% of the people I tell that I did this, is, hold on, what are you doing? Why do you want to do this? I didn't have to do that. They, they actually got it. They totally understood why this was the right path and they were passionate about the space and, um, and they were interested in me and, and, and more of how do they help me get there um, versus kind of trying to understand, you know, how they could, how could they, how they can make money off of this kind of potential transaction. So that was the first one. The second one for me is, did they have the chops um, to push me? And and I think, you know, once, it, Liz, you said this, once I kind of get zeroed in on something, I'm a bit of a, you know, dog with bone, like kind of go after it and I kind of narrow in on that focus. And for me, it was really important to have advisors like uh, Joel, um, Brad, and obviously Liz, you and the team around me to actually pull me back a little bit and to challenge my thought process and to really push a little bit to kind of say, are you sure? What about this? It wasn't just a bunch of yeses, we'll do this. It was like, I needed I needed partners uh, with me to form this team. And they certainly fit that bowl. And then the third one was, uh, did they have did they have a sense of urgency um, uh, to, to, to getting this done? And for me, um, getting reps and getting into the game of, of business entrepreneurship was more important than, you know, kind of sitting in front of my computer and trying to find the perfect business for two years. Like I, I just couldn't fathom doing that. I would have, I would have drove everyone around me crazy. So I needed, I needed kind of teammates around me that could actually move with me at the pace and, and also um, understand that I think time does kill all deals or is a big factor in deals. This particular one, there was some stellar fatigue involved. I needed to move quickly with the right team with a sense of urgency. And, and these two individuals were, were more than willing to step up to plate and did a phenomenal job with that. A nice summary, Andrew. Uh, Joel, that's, that's hard to follow. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Liz. Um, I, I had to laugh. Andrew said chops. And I was thinking, oh, Brad and I have facial hair. Like, is he talking about how we like had our beards customized or something? But no, I, I, it, from a banking lens, it really comes down to when it comes to acquisition financing, um, you know, 
Liz, you guys do a great job of sending inf some information as a nice package to the banks to, to get a sense. So, you know, you sent a one pager about Andrew before I even met him, right? So I got a quick resume, if you will, and understanding, you know, what he already explained his background was. Um, so, you know, a level like the, the experience in management and leadership and business is more important to me um, than actually having a knowledgeable mindset about patio furniture operations. Like, to me, it's it, you don't have to be an expert in the business that you're buying um, necessarily. It's more about it really comes down to character. I'm as a banker, if I'm going to go to bat for you and look for an approval on however many, many, uh, many millions of dollars, it's got to be because I believe in the actual individual like Andrew. And so this isn't to pump Andrew's tires too much, but that's really what it came down to was, is there integrity? Can I trust what he's saying is and, and ultimately is this going to be a solid partnership to kind of work from? Um, Andrew and I quickly found out that we, we we built rapport, but then naturally actually found overlap in our in our network. Soon after that first meeting, um, I remember having that initial meeting with <laughs> yourself and Andrew, and I, it was around Stampede time, and I and I had a Stampede client event to run to, and I was thinking, oh, this meeting is going a little bit late. I got to get going, and you know, thirty minutes later, I'm at this event, and who's there? Andrew's there because he knows my other clients. And there's a third client there. And so that itself actually built even more trust into the relationship because now we have trusted advisors that we already almost like your reference you list to, to, to go off of. to know. But, but character is definitely what I, what I would say it comes back down to when you're acquiring a business and that old owner is going to be exiting in the, in the, you know, short term or interim. Um, I need to trust that Andrew can pick up the reins and, and continue that business going forward. So. Yeah, and, and sim similar for me, uh, you know, right away for, after meeting Andrew, you know, it became pretty apparent that he's a genuinely likable, nice guy, but also super driven, super smart. And he, you know, he he really wanted to do this deal. Um, and from my perspective as, as legal counsel, it makes my life and job a lot easier when you have um, when you, when you're working with clients who, you know, who have that sophistication, they understand what they want, they want, you know, they know what they want in, in the deal and, um, they don't, uh, require, you know, a ton of hand holding. So it made my life a lot easier. That being said, you know, we work with a lot of clients who don't have that level of sophistication too, but it, it's just, it just made the deal go a lot smoother from a legal perspective, having, you know, sort of Andrew's level of sophistication, um, and yeah, so I, and I think, you know, after our meet, initial meeting, we just, I just really connected with him. We, we, we sort of seemed to build good rapport, similar to Joel. Um, and uh, I was really excited. I know he had options when he was, you know, I wasn't the only lawyer he was looking for. So, or he was talking to. So I was um, really, really happy when he gave me the call and said that he was going to, uh, he decided to go with me because um, I was, you know, really looking forward to, to working with him. So, yeah. Thanks, guys. We um, we put a lot of pressure on people to really, you know, make sure you're working with the right people um, and building that right team around around yourself when you're buying a business. So so it's good color for you guys to all add. So thank you for that. Um, so now that we've laid a bit of foundation, let's jump into some of the deal details. So I'd like to I'd love to start with um, a bit of the structure, Andrew, and and your percentage of ownership because when some people, you know, a lot of people are starting to get into you know, the idea of buying a business and one of the biggest questions is, well, how much of this company am I going to own? And often when you start looking for a business to buy, sometimes you don't have all those answers or, or, you know, like you had said, you know, this was a business that you could afford. It was in your ballpark. Um, but sometimes people are looking and they, they don't have a crystal clear picture of, Am I going to use all my capital or am I going to use co-investors and that sort of thing? So for you, Andrew, like ultimately you and the seller arrived at a mutual agreement of the seller's support and then providing some seller financing and then provide them providing some seller financing. So um, understanding that, you know, you came in, you ended up buying 100 percent of the camp company. You were able to do that with the structure that you designed with the seller and the vendor financing and with. RBCs backing you, um, but you didn't know that um, in the beginning. Can you can you speak to to how that, that unraveled? Yeah, no, good good question. And I think maybe we'll 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 delve into because I, I know this community particularly, and because I was I was part of it and still today is like what are the details of kind of the structure. So I think we'll 
we'll, we'll touch on that maybe a little bit later on um, as much as we can. But I, but I think maybe uh, let me let me take a step back and kind of I think you made a really uh, important point, and I don't think this point gets talked about enough in the space. And that's for the search community when you're doing like me a self-funded search. Um, you know, that, that's a choice in its own right. Obviously, you've got a couple different paths there. You can do traditional, you can do self-funded. We're talking today about self-funded, which is what I did. And I think, you know, you early on, um, I, had a, I had a framework that I had listened to. I can't remember what it was, but uh, one, one of the podcasts, one of these, these gentlemen that were talking about it. And, and this was the concept around, do you want to own a watermelon or do you want to own a grape? And, you know, what, what, what do I mean by that? I think, you know, if you're, uh, the size of your deal is, is going to really um, largely dictate, you know, um, the cap structure that you're able to kind of put, put forward. And I think you want to decide like early on is full ownership um, something that I, I really uh, want in this career transition or this career path that I want to take? W would I be okay with a minority shareholder position? Would, would I be okay with some form of, of you know, equity and, and other shareholders at the cap table with me? So that's a really, really important decision. And because I was a practitioner, because I have, you know, 20 plus years of actually, you know, leading and building businesses and brands and all that, like I, I have some skill sets that, you know, some others in the space may not have. So I had opportunities early on to come in, um, you know, on deals as a minority shareholder. And for many of you on the call, you're probably going to be similar. Like th that will come up as you start to kick tires, you're going to start to, you know, figure out that there, there's opportunity out here to actually be an operator, but you know, there might be some dollars backing you in the cap table uh, and that might work. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, swaying anybody from making that decision. However, I would say it was not for me. I made a clear distinction early on in my process that for me to do this properly, to have the right capital structure to do this deal, I needed to own hundred percent of the company. And that was a choice and just encourage everybody as you go through this process, um, spend some time on that and just make sure you're clear on what you want because a watermelon may seem like there's bigger, better and less risk there. And, and certainly that is the case. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but there's also trade-offs with that watermelon. And there's also trade-offs when you own the grape, right? You're going to be buying a bit of a smaller business. Yes, you're going to have ownership on the business. It might not have the SDE or the the, or the, the earnings that, you know, obviously are going to uh, let you run this thing without, you know, getting truly involved as an operator, but it's a big choice. And my choice was I wanted to own 100% of it. And, you know, that that really helped me have conviction, Liz, to go through the process and, and work with my team to figure out how do I actually do that. Thanks, Andrew. And so Joel and, and Brad, I'll, I'll put a spin on this question a little bit from what we, we briefed on this question a little bit before. We're going to put a bit of a spin on it for you guys. It's, you know, what are what are you seeing in terms of people coming in with with co-investors or or in combination with with seller financing? Because Andrew's Andrew did his deal self-funded, but with seller financing. And so where are you guys seeing this mixture of people coming in? Are, with, are they coming in with other investors or are you seeing more of the seller financing play a role in, in the deals that you guys are seeing? And then we can segue into more of the seller financing conversation. Joel, do you want to go? Right. Yeah, uh, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll go in first, Brad. And then, um, so I I see Liz a lot of self-funded deals, much like Andrew's scenario where you they, they, you want the the 100% ownership. Um, you don't want the dilution. It, it's, it's a personal choice and it's kind of, uh, I would say it's very size dependent. If if I'm talking about some senior commercial files I've looked at, where private equity or or you know bigger bigger deal size comes in, it's it's quite hard to do that self funded. So then you then you might look to investment and and they're and they're both bankable deals. There's not one right answer, and that's kind of why I love this space is because every individual that's looking to buy and every business is a little bit different. So there's no real one shoe size fits all. Um, so but but what I've primarily worked on seen in the Calgary and Western Canada market has been a lot of self-funded deals in the space. That being said, you're absolutely right. I would argue in this day and age with the rate environment we're in with the ever increasing servicing, um, like just, just where we're at as a, as an economy and such BTBs, vendor take backs and, and seller financing is a part of almost every deal, big or small. 
Um, it's, it's something that from a bank standpoint, we almost prefer to see um, because a big part of what we need to, to understand is that continuity of cash flows that when maybe potentially this owner who found this business and is exiting and Andrew's coming in the new, as a new guy, is all the relationships or all the cash flows dependent upon that old owner who started this whole, whole show. And if so, or if there's an overlap, we want continuity there. So a vendor take back being paid out over maybe two, three, five years, that keeps that previous owner invested into that business and is going to make sure a, a more seamless transition happens to new ownership. Um, so, you know, financial, like for, from a, from a deal structure on the financing standpoint, uh, a bank, we generally can go up to 75% financing. Um, it can go smaller or, or larger than that, but there's going to be a, a down payment that has to come. Well, that could come from the VTB. And ultimately that's what we're seeing a lot of right now in the, in the space is that if, if a seller really wants to, to get rid of their business, that they're going to have to kind of put that uh, piece on the line, but maybe I'll kind of stop there and let Brad go. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Joel. Um, I, I agree with everything Joel said. Um, in, in this sort of current high interest rate environment, we're seeing a lot of um, uh, vendor financing, vendor take backs. Um, uh, it's, it's pretty common. Um, and, and, uh, in my own experience, I don't see a ton of deals with co-investors for small business M and A transactions. It's it's mostly similar to what Andrew did with with, with the self fund. Um, but that being said, you know we do see co-investors uh, from time to time. And one thing I think uh, it's important for people to understand uh, when you're bringing on other investors is that it will add um, like complexity and time uh, and cost to your trend to structuring your transaction um, because you know typically what you do is you incorporate um, a special purpose vehicles or like a hold core or something that is the, the that becomes the purchaser of the target and then that that entity is owned by you know the the various the you know the the, the entrepreneur and the co-investors and so you typically have to set that up and you want a unanimous shareholder agreement in place. So all of these sort of legal considerations that you need to take, um, you need to sort of uh, consider when you're when you're setting that sort of structure up. Um, it's important to, to understand that I think it just you're going to have to build time into your into your into your journey. And in, in addition, in addition to that cost uh, from a legal perspective and. Um, and, and there's negotiating that goes on. So you're, you're negotiating with your co-investors first, and then you're negotiating with the target secondly. So, so just, you know, that complexity is important, I think, to understand if you are considering doing a co-investment. Thanks for that, Brad. There's a couple of real nuggets in there for sure. Um, Andrew, I'm going to throw it back to you. And so, and, and also Joel, it's really interesting that you said that you're seeing this in almost all deals right now, big and small, like that's, that's really interesting even for myself. And we see a lot of these deals too, but to hear it from you that it, it's happening across the board is, is really interesting. And, and so Andrew, when you first introduced the concept of the, the vendor financing part of your deal, how was that? received because that's a big conversation point that we hear a lot of is how does this concept get introduced to the business owner right now and sometimes they've never heard of it before like what do you mean I'm not going to get all my money at yeah. closing um and and there was a journey that you went through with that so I'll uh, I'll let you run with it yeah and, and it just just to double click a little bit on what Joel said I think I think it's a really really important point uh particularly in this environment that we're in right now. I think if you're if you're trying to transact on a deal and get a structure right, and if you're not able to get um, you know seller financing as part of that, it's a pretty big red flag. I think Joel would agree with that. Like it, that that that's kind of table stakes in a lot of ways. And I think previously, you know, given the environment we're in on high interest rates, we're not. I think traditionally, and particularly those that are really getting their their content from the U.S., just because kind of um, you know EA is 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 much bigger there right now. Um, is kind of the SBA side and 10%. And that's kind of the traditional structure. I, I think that's honestly a load of crop because as, as a seller coming into this environment right now, you have to be willing to kind of go into 15, 20% or above more than that. I'm seeing I'm like definitely stuff that's 30, 40% on seller financing is kind of, you know, um, certainly not out of the norm. Maybe it was five years ago. I don't think it's out of the norm today, but obviously Joel know better than that. That's just my kind of two cents there. 
couple things on this point, I think I just want to highlight. Um, I think for me on the seller financing piece, Liz, that you mentioned, you're absolutely correct. This is not, you know, we, we take this concept for granted because we're kind of talking about it all the time, but put yourself in the seller's shoes. Like what, what the hell is a VTB? And what do you mean? I'm not going to get my money on close. Like, what is that all about? How does that work? Um, so other, other quick tidbit I'd, I'd say is like, as you're doing these things, like, honestly, one of the key things for me in this deal, there's no way this would have gotten done without having a really solid advisory team in the middle of this deal. And I was fortunate, you know, full stop MNP was in the middle of this and they were awesome. And they were awesome because they play such a critical role, uh, in coaching the seller, uh, and coaching me quite, quite honestly. I mean, I had a great team around me. Um, but but on MNP played a played a key role on both sides, and they had to right because this is this is this isn't easy stuff. This is complicated, um, you know, financing that we're talking about in a lot of ways. So um, so yeah, it's certainly a key learning for me, and certainly one I'd share is just if if you have any anxiety or doubts around that advisory or broker in the middle of this, um, really push on that because they're going to help move this thing along at the pace that it needs to move along. And inevitably what's going to happen, um, you know, there's going to be uncertainty and there's going to be areas of what you think the other party heard or what the other party understands is actually not the case. So, so you got to press on that and having a good advisory uh, broker in the middle is, is, is a key, key piece of that. The other thing I did, I think that's really, really important and this was me, but I highly recommend it for everybody, regardless of how good the advisor uh, on the other side is, I made a choice early on to get connected with the seller immediately, almost to go through the, the advisory team and actually create a relationship with the seller. Because I knew no matter what happened in this deal, you know, you hear a deal dies a thousand times before it actually gets done. I don't think my deal died that many times, but there were certainly points of the deal as we were navigating the constructs of this financing, that it was just really complicated. And if I didn't have that relationship where I could look at my seller, you know, across the table in the whites of their eyes and actually explain to them what I was trying to do and understand their positioning, there's no way it would have got done. And, I, and, 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 you know, so don't leave that solely to the advisory group or the broker in the middle of this. You as the buyer need to really push to get that relationship because inevitably it's going to come to, Two human beings that want to transact, that have a desire to transact, and do they trust each other to transact? And um, if you can't get that, uh, good luck trying to get the deal done. And you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. So, so um, yeah, just just I'd make my two cents there. Financing was there, definitely not easy. Definitely lots of context to build. Played a role with the advisory group. I played a role, they play, like it, it is very, very cross-functional in how you do this, but build that relationship early on. You're going to need it because there's going to be some trying, honest, adult conversations at the 11th hour that need to happen. Yeah, I, I love that you just said adult conversations. Um, coming from someone who has four children. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, that's great. And I'm going to come back to you on a point here. Um, and there's actually a really timely question in the chat right now that I'm going to feed to you, Joel, here. Um, so as far as, yeah, priming the seller for accepting the, the vendor financing. And Andrew, you, you made a really good point that, you know, at the end of the day, you got to build trust with the business owner because they need to trust that you're not going to kill the business because they've got money on the line and they need to believe that you can run this company when they're not there anymore. And right. that's building that trust is, is so integral to getting them to accept that VTB. Um, Joel, the question in the chat is how to structure VTB amortization schedule so that will be it will be considered equity to the senior debt. And you mentioned this earlier when you said that, you know, the banks will come up to 75 percent, that 25 percent can be considered the, the vendor financing can be considered that equity portion. Um, and. Can you speak to that? Can you speak to that subordination that that comes in as a as a covenant? Because Andrew ran into this, and and I know he can elaborate on it. And then Brad will get your your two cents too. Yeah, I was just gonna say, Liz. Good thing we have a lawyer in the room, so I don't actually have to back what I'm about <laughs> to say. But but no, it, so it's it's simple. I saw the question too, so it's a great question. So yeah, at the end of the day, 
it, the bank is taking on the bulk of the debt, we will want to be, remain first priority. And so how that's done is a postponement of the VTB and subordinated to the to RBC or to the bank of, of choice. So it's just a it's a legal agreement that Brad or, or Faskin or, you know, um, that they can draft up just, just says, hey, in the event of like ultimate worst case scenario, in the event of a default or anything like that, RBC is the priority payable here. We would get settled first before the vendor gets their funds. Um, and, and I would argue, I, I mean, Brad, feel free to share differently if, if you've seen it different. No, no vendor financer, like they don't really bark at that. That's standard. They understand that a big bank is going to want to have that priority. Um, and if, even if they have an issue with that, generally they're not going to do vendor financing at all. Um, but that's kind of how it works is it's just a simple postponed and subordination agreement. Um, so the VTB can still be on there and registered with Andrew and all things Cedar, but, but RBC or the bank is just first priority. So that, yeah, that, I think that that's, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly it, Joel. Um, so yeah, I think as a seller of a business, I think what you um, need to get comfortable with, um, if there is bank financing and vendor financing, is that you know the bank's going to get paid out first, and if if there's a default, and what that means is there may not be enough money at the end of the day for you to get paid out. Um, you know, if worst case scenario, the bank the bank's priority. So um, that is a, a conversation that you know is important to have, and and as a seller, it's really important to understand that as well. Um, I'm going to put it back to you, Andrew, because you had this come up and when you said that M&P was really critical to their presence and their guidance on the seller was really important. Um, they weren't aware that their their portion of financing, um, they weren't going to get it right away, right, is my understanding, right? So for you, um, t can you can you tell us how how that happened like and and how it was resolved? Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, I think that's it. And the way I structured mine was like, there was some, there was some ability where Joel was able to kind of work with me on this, where at least interest annually was part of this. So, so, so the note that the seller took, you know, came with some interest and that, that interest was, was okay. As long as, you know, obviously, you know, we generated the, the cash to actually pay that and, and the bank was, was still getting theirs first. So, um, so that helped, but I, but I, I think this this was this was just education. This was like, look, this is how it's going to go, and I pushed on this several times with MNP to make sure that you know the seller knew. They guaranteed me a couple times that yes, it is. But when I actually pushed hard on that and actually laid out, this is what happens, right? Like, you're going to get interest, but you're not going to get any principal payments for I think we're I think like five six years, whatever you know we have in there. I think, and that was kind of like a, a shock to the system at the 11th hour. So you, you know, you introduce seller financing, it, it's kind of a, a concept that needs to get, you know, talked about, discussed, but laid out. So show the seller exactly what happens if scenario A, scenario B, scenario C happens. I had to do that. And it took me about two or three times to do it. But again, I wouldn't have been able to do that if I hadn't built the trust early on to actually say, this is how it's going to go. And, um, uh, we were able to get that resolved, but it, but it actually went down to like the literally the final days of close, and and Joel and Brad know this. Like it, it was very close to actually not coming to fruition because there was some uncertainty as to exactly how this is going to transact. But but we got there. We got there. Um, we're starting to see the questions come in, and I know you guys wanted to talk about due diligence as well. So, um. Andrew, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a, a couple minutes to talk about due diligence, and then we can get leave a couple minutes for. And I know we wanted to leave more time for this, but um, unfortunately, we're running out. So, Andrew, do you want to leave your nuggets on due diligence, and then we can address some of the questions? Joel, in the meantime, do you want to take a look at the questions in the chat because they're they're uh, they're for you? Yeah, yeah. You, you, the only thing the only thing I'll say on 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 due diligence is look, you know. Um, I close fairly quickly. Um, and I think, you know, you can make two arguments on that. I think you can say, look, more time on due diligence would be advantageous for obvious reasons. But I also think too, like, as as a buyer, you're not going to truly know everything until you get in and start doing reps in the business. So like, don't get too analysis paralysis in your due diligence. If I was to share kind of one piece around where I, I think pushing on a little bit hard in due diligence would have been that working capital peg. So without getting into all the details, if you don't know what that means, 
it basically means when you transact, you know, you have to have enough or fuel in the tank to actually get the business to the next level. And that's a really interesting concept for a seller to understand. Like, what do you mean I have to leave receivables? I need to leave inventory, um, you know, prepaids. So how does that work? So like, that was a big one for us. And this is a seasonal business, right? Like I, I, I manufacture patio furniture. So like definition of seasonal, which is risk in here. So working capital is so critical. It's so difficult to do. It's not easy. Um, but working capital in a seasonal business is even more difficult. Spend time on getting that peg right. Spend the resources that you need to start talking about that early on with your team and the seller because inevitably, as much as you think that you understand it and the seller understands it, um, this has to almost start day one of due diligence because it's so critical. If you get it wrong and you don't capitalize the business properly, um, you know it's, it's going to be a really hard headwind to get out of. Thanks for that, Andrew. Brad, I'm going to um, toss it over to you in, in relation to the due diligence and what you see, because you see things at that final hour and you see when people, the realization hits of some of these terms. So you'd love to get your 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 perspective on it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I just uh, would echo a lot of what Andrew said is um, the number one dispute that I see um, in a post-closing uh, scenario is around the working capital peg that um, that the parties agreed to in the deal. Um, and, and, and so, you know, it's, it, it all comes down to sort of most deals are structured so that if you, you know, you do a calculation um, 30 days or 60 days after closing to see what was the working capital at the closing date. Is it above or below that peg that you guys have mutually agreed to? If it's above, you increase the purchase price. If it's below, you have a decrease the purchase price. And that is the number one area of disagreement that I see. So it's really, really important to spend the time to, to get that peg right. It has to be a realistic number for the business. Um, and usually it's based on a historical average. So that's not really legal. Like we, we, we can help, but that's more of a financial sort of due diligence. But from a legal perspective, you know, we can go as deep or as shallow as our clients want. So, you know, the very basic, we'll order public record searches, make sure there's no lawsuits, that sort of thing affecting the clients. And then we can do, you know, reviewing their material contracts, that sort of thing. And we usually will prepare a legal due diligence report that sort of identifies all the issues, if any, that we found. And then um, what we do is we can, we can integrate those issues into the purchase and sale agreement by sort of creating car votes for indemnifications and that sort of thing. So, so from a legal perspective, the due diligence is very important because it will feed into the purchase and sale agreement. Thank you, uh, Joel. Thank you for answering those questions. Um, there's some question, financing related questions. If you're not monitoring the chat, feel free to, to jump in there. But I have an interesting question from Andrew or from Eric for Andrew. Sorry. Um, and I, I know, Eric and Eric's a sell side advisor just for context, Andrew, but this is, we're not going to get into the price Andrew paid for the business, certainly, but he, this is interesting. Andrew, did you pay a little more for the business to soften the VTB ask? Like, how did you kind of balance, balance that? Yeah, two things. Good question. Two things. Yeah, I think, you know, um, there's obviously the concept of, uh, a share purchase deal or an asset based deal. Um, I did a share purchase deal. So there was obviously a little bit of wiggle room I had there around how to pay for a multiple and what that could look like. A share purchase deal for those that aren't aware is much more advantageous to the seller. Um, but to answer your question, yeah. So um, the ability for me to pay a little bit more, and I worked very closely with Joel on this, by the way, this is another thing that Joel and I worked on is as I built a relationship with Joel, I was able to go to him and say, hey, what about this? Like. Would you be okay with this? This is what I'm thinking. And Joel was really, really important in the structure. But where we had a difference on valuation, solve that through an earnout. And you know that was a great tool for us to use. Um, so paid a little bit more, yes, but their earnout really is the driver, and that earnout is tied directly to EBITDA. So you know there's a threshold of EBITDA that we have to hit. If we hit that number, great. You know there's going to be some some valuation dollars that can go back to the seller, and I'm fine with that. Uh, if we don't, then obviously, you know, I'm protected on the downside there a little bit too. So th that's how we solved, went a little bit higher to manage this with a higher seller note, but also the difference was solved through an earn note, which was, which was a really great tool for this deal. Amazing. Thanks for mentioning that, Andrew. Um, Joel, Brad, do you have anything to add on that last question? I can, I mean, again, I, I would echo Andrew in the, uh, saying that earnouts are a really good mechanism to sort of bridge that gap in terms of valuation and very common. 
Yeah, if earn out is a new term for you, I highly recommend you uh, Google it or get to know that term. And what we see is earn outs, uh, um, you know, can get applied to top line revenue, a percentage of top line revenue or a percentage of bottom line too. And they, and they can, that can change the structure of the deal substantially. Um, uh, Joanna is asking, uh, you mentioned seller fatigue earlier. I'm curious how that played out in the deal and the financing. Did you did you find that there was seller fatigue, Andrew, and 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 how was that uh, resolved? Yeah, yeah, uh, really important points. Good question. I think um, the psyche of the seller needs to be something you test early and test often because um, I've talked to many searchers kind of since I've done this and, and in the process, and this is kind of one of the top things that you see is like you you get a seller that is thinking about it but not really. And you waste a ton of time and resources by the time you get there. And all of a sudden it's like, now nah, I'm, I'm not done. My deal was slightly different. There was, um, there was a bit of fatigue in it because there was a fill process previously. Um, and I knew that walking in. So that, and again, this is a great role that MMP played, right? Because, you know, they had to vet, was I serious? And was I able to move quickly because there was fatigue here in the deal? And that was important for me to know as the buyer that, you know, I couldn't mess around here. And if I did mess around and took too long and, uh, you know, kicking tires to say, you know, this deal could, could walk away. So important to know, but if you have fatigue, if the deal, and this will happen, right. If, if this will happen on some deals, if they don't necessarily transact or if they're under LOI with somebody else, they fall apart for whatever reason. Uh, and I understood where mine previously was, and and um, I know I was comfortable with that. Um, there's an opportunity as the buyer to come in there, just be aware that you know fatigue does play a role, and it can be an opportunity or it can be a risk, and how you approach that is really really important. Andrew, quick question here from Jordan: How many deals did you look at in the six month period prior to um, prior to finding this one? Uh, you know, I, you know, a few. I really, you know, I only put one LOI in. So, so that's, that's interesting because Liz, I don't know what the number is, but it's like, what, seven on average, give or take, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. On average before you get an actual. So this was really the only LOI. I looked at a few, obviously like scouring, you know, biz buy sell and all that stuff. I had a few that I really went deeper on, but this was the one when I kind of got into it, I, I was pretty, you know, um, convicted that I was going to go after it. Only one LOI. So pretty good batting average, but, uh, but not the norm. Certainly not the norm. Um, we've got about one minute left. I'm just going to ask each of you um, any parting advice for people who are going down this path. Um, Brad, do you want to get start? Do you want to kick off? Sure. Yeah. Uh, hire a good lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've heard you say that before. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> Joel. <laughs> yeah. Pass it on to Joel. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Hey, Brad, just just mic drop. Um, I, I could say hire a good banker too. Uh, no, I, I, it's it's true, Brad. We we obviously want people's business because we think <clears throat> we're we're valued advisors. Uh, I would say, don't yeah, work closely with your banker. Um, it no deals the same, and and there's no real hundred percent white or like black or white answers. Um, Andrew and I talk about the different things. He actually had a, a competitive offer that I wasn't offering right away, and he said at the end of the day, I think we went because we had that trust and that flexibility that he knew I'd work with him and I'd work with him. Uh, and that's a lot more important than a 10 basis point difference in rate or fee. Um, you yes. you want to trust a tr strategic partner. So that would be my advice. Thanks, Joel. Andrew, last that, party. That's, were... a, that's a great point, Joel. Totally, totally bang on. Look, my only advice to everybody on there is just ask yourself why you're doing this if you are in a search kind of mode. And if it's solely just for, you know, the wealth creation, then it may not be for you because look, there, this is not easy. It's not for the faint at heart that will come. But if that, that's your primary resource as to why you're doing it or, or the drive that doing it, it's, it's not going to get you through some of the challenging times that you're inevitably going to face. There is a massive opportunity here to build resiliency, to develop your career, to fulfill some areas that we all need, that we want, that why we're here. Um, and, and quite frankly, the best thing about this so far in my early tenure is the impact I can make with the employees under my tenure. Uh, so like that is a huge, huge opportunity. So just don't do it for the money. Ask yourself, what are you doing this for? Do you have the chops to do it? If you're doing it for the right reasons, it's awesome. And, and get a great team, by the way. So shameless plug. <laughs> definitely get Liz. Definitely get Brad and definitely get Joel and your team. I mean, these are the controllables that you can control. Get a great team. This is a great team. 
Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you all for everyone for your time for being here today. Hope you enjoyed the session. If you've got questions uh, for these guys afterwards, you can find them on LinkedIn. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Brad and Joel. I know you guys are really busy and Andrew, uh, it's you're, you're drinking from a fire hose right now. So we really appreciate <laughs> yeah. sharing the time. Um,